Gonzaga is just outside the top 10 in the Almanac's preseason rankings. Is that where they belong? We discuss that as well as Mark Few's quotes on the team on today's Locked on Zags. You are Locked on Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50 plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. Well, folks, we got a women's basketball non-conference schedule reveal to discuss. We're going to close out the show with that. But first, the Almanac is here. It is college basketball's biggest preseason event. It is a a massive spectacle, folks. If you have not ordered this thing, I highly recommend. I will post a link in the show notes. It is a combination of folks at the Field of 68, at Verbal Commits, at Heat Check College Basketball, uh, at Three Man Weave, Handful Letter Places, got together to create this 800,000 word document. It is a website. You can purchase it. I think it's $20 right now. Uh, Fantastic analysis on every single team in college basketball. Seriously, folks, highly recommend this document. And they had a lot of words about Gonzaga. They had a lot of thoughts. They had a lot of thoughts on the WCC, on Gonzaga, where they're ranked, how many of their players are in the top 100, some quotes from Mark Few. We're going to talk about all of that. I'm not going to give it all away. Folks, I do not want to just steal everything in this document and present it to you all. So there are going to be some things that are going to stay in that document. So again, if you haven't ordered it yet and you're interested, definitely check it out. First things first, the group of people who put this document together did a preseason top 25 collaboration amongst all of them. And our Zags were 11. The top 10, according to them, Duke Kansas, Purdue, who, of course, Gonzaga will play in the uh, Maui Invitational this year, their first opponent. Michigan State comes in at number four. Houston's number five. A trio of Big East teams come next. Creighton at six, Marquette at seven, and UConn, of course, another team on Gonzaga's schedule. They come in at number eight. Tennessee as nine, and last year's final four, Darling Florida Atlantic University comes in at 10. Gonzaga, of course, right behind them at 11. There's a handful of other teams the Zags are going to face. St. Mary's comes in at number 22. Zags will get them at least twice, potentially three times next season. Other non-conference opponents for Gonzaga in this top 25. Kentucky comes in at number 15. Zags will play them in February 10th in a mid-season non-conference battle at Rupp Arena. San Diego State comes in at number 16. They'll play them in late December. And then USC, the Zags opponent in Las Vegas on December 2nd, they come in at number 23. So Zags are guaranteed to play four teams in this top 25 in their non-conference slate. They will probably play at least one more. I suppose it depends how the bracket shakes out. Gonzaga's second opponent in the Maui Invitational could very well be Tennessee, who came in at number nine on this list. Gonzaga's third, it'll either be Tennessee or Syracuse, I should specify. Uh, And then Gonzaga's third opponent could be some combination of Marquette, who came in at number seven. Kansas could be that opponent. They came in at number two. Uh, UCLA was in the others receiving votes category. They didn't actually crack the top 25, but they're a possible opponent for Gonzaga as well. So lots of great teams on Gonzaga's non-conference schedule. Not that we didn't already know that looking at this slate. For me, 11 feels pretty good. 11 feels like a solid spot for Gonzaga to be. A lot of other places have them kind of in the 15 to 20 range. I've seen 16, 18. I've seen 15, 13, somewhere in there. 11 is one of the higher spots that I've seen them placed. And a part of that is just the kind of unknown about this team. And that was a lot of what the write-up that was done by Jeff Goodman talking about Gonzaga. That's kind of a lot of what it was about. 
They do do lineup predictions, and I did want to talk about that because the lineup, the starting lineup that they projected for Gonzaga is very similar to the, in fact, it is the same as the starting lineup that we have been projecting here on Locked on Zags. That's Ryan Nemhard and Nolan Hickman in the backcourt, Steel Venters at the three, and Graham, uh, excuse me, Anton Watson and Graham E.K. in the front court. Uh, feels like kind of most people's projection for Gonzaga's starting lineup right now. I think there's a lot of questions of what the depth is going to look like. But as I've said on this podcast before, six players are guaranteed ro- rotation spots, those five starters, as well as backup center Ben Gregg. A couple of good quotes from Mark Few in this uh, article, in this write-up about Gonzaga. He talked about kind of an overall statement about the team in the post-Drew Timmy era. I'm going to read his quote here. He says, we're going to be totally different without Drew. He was such a big personality, a great player, and a great entity for Gonzaga. It leaves a huge void, but I still think we can be pretty good this season. I love Mark Few. He's never going to say a team's going to be great. Uh, We'll be pretty good. (laughs) That's, That's kind of just the way that Mark Few talks about these teams. And I think that that's reasonable. This team is more difficult to project than I think they've been in a long time. And a big part of it is Drew Timmy's absence. Also no Julian Strother. Also no Rasir Bolton or Malachi Smith. Nolan Hickman is kind of an unknown in terms of what he can bring to this team. And frankly, he was listed as the team's biggest X, X factor. And that, I think that's a totally reasonable take. I've talked about Jun Sak Yo on the show a handful of times, and Yo was not mentioned a ton in this write-up. Maybe he's being slept on. Maybe Mark Few kind of held him close to the vest in terms of revealing a lot about their vision for him, which would be totally understandable. Maybe they are, uh, you know, a little unsure about what his role is going to be at the time of, of, you know, talking about this. They didn't say a whole lot. But in terms of players who we know are going to be in the rotation, Nolan Hickman is the X factor. And Mark Few said as much. His direct quote was, he needs to be a huge, he needs to be huge for us this year because we really need him. And I think that's totally reasonable. And the, the write-up that talked a lot about how Hickman is going to adjust to an off-ball role and how that could help him, you know, just in terms of a maturity perspective, it could help him kind of not have as much pressure on him, not be the primary ball handler, of course, getting to team up with one of the best point guards in college basketball. And here I'll read another quote from Mark Few who said, Ryan's as good a point guard as there is in college basketball. Simple, succinct, and accurate about Ryan Nembhard. But Ryan's going to be great. How Hickman adjusts to an off-ball role, how he handles that adjustment, how he handles just the maturity going from his sophomore year to his junior year uh, is really a big part of what's going to happen for Gonzaga next year. A couple more things I wanted to talk about. The Almanac also released their top 100 players for the 2023-24 college basketball season. Three Zags, three Zags in the top 100 players for next season. In fact, three Zags in the top 50. That's pretty darn cool for Gonzaga. Of course, no surprise here. Ryan Nempard leads the list. He comes in at number 17 among the best college basketball players next season. Anton Watson is next. He comes in at 38. What a jump for Anton Watson to be a, a guy who didn't start for most of his college basketball career at Gonzaga. Now heads into his fifth and final season of eligibility as one of the 40 best players in college basketball. Number three is Graham E.K., the big center coming over from Wyoming, guy who averaged 19 and nine and a half rebounds at Wyoming, not last year, but the year before when he was healthy. His health will, of course, be a big question for Gonzaga uh, or a big factor for Gonzaga going into the season. He comes in at number 48. A couple other notable guys on here, former Zag Umar Balo came in at number 13 for Tommy Lloyd and the Arizona Wildcats. St. Mary's point guard Aiden Mahaney came in at number 19. We'll talk more about him in the second segment. A handful of players Gonzaga pursued in the transfer portal or reportedly pursued in the transfer portal come in as well. Caleb Love comes in at 54. He, of course, joins Umar Umar Balo at Arizona. Steven Ashworth comes in at 57. Ashworth is the guy who replaced Ryan Nempart at the point guard spot for Creighton. Grant Nelson, the unicorn from North Dakota State who transferred to Alabama. He comes in at 66. Fardaz Amak, who transferred to Cal, was a target for Gonzaga coming out of Utah Valley, was reportedly a target for Gonzaga coming out of Texas Tech this year as well. He is coming in at 84. And the lone member of BYU, Gonzaga's former conference foe out of the WCC, is Fusini Traore. He is going to be the best player for that team as they transition into the Big 12. Let's stick with the WCC. How does the Almanac project the WCC standings to shake out? Are there any Zags taking home their preseason conference award predictions? More on that coming up after a word from today's sponsor, Jace Medical. 
What would happen if you found yourself cut off from modern medical care and treatment? I'm guessing you wouldn't be all that prepared. Maybe it's supply chain issues because of a global pandemic, or you're on an outdoor adventure, or there's a natural disaster, or you're traveling in a different country with different standards of care. If you're like me, you need the Jace case from Jace Medical. The Jace case provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use. All it takes to get a Jace case is to fill out a simple online form, and then you get a prescription and life-saving medications delivered straight to your door. I love it because the Jace case gives you that peace of mind so that you're not just hoping that you have access to medication in an emergency. Jace Medical makes sure you have the medication in your hands. Save more than $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics with Jace Medical, plus an additional $20 off by using my code Locked On at checkout on jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. Doctor created, doctor recommended. That's Jace Medical. All right, folks, I want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen or your first watch of the day. Shout out to those on YouTube as well. We are, as I'm recording this, just short of 2,000 subscribers. Right there, right there. By the time you're listening to this, we might be already over 2,000, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't go hit that subscribe button. It is very much appreciated to help keep the channel growing as we get closer and closer to the college basketball season. Here, we're going to continue to talk about the Almanac and the release of one of college basketball's best, if not the very best preseason document that you can have on hand if you want to follow this sport as closely as possible heading into next season. And they have a WCC preview series talking all about the conference, projecting how the team's going to how the teams are going to rank, projecting the award predictions as well. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Drum roll, who are they going to pick between Gonzaga and St. Mary's? That's always the question mark. And they're sticking with the team that has done it more than anybody else in the last 25 years. Gonzaga is projected to win the WCC next season over St. Mary's. It's going to be a two-man race. It's been a two-man race for a long time. For a while, it was a one-man race. But St. Mary's has climbed into that conversation where they are a very obvious, legit threat to win the WCC year in and year out. They're going to be a real challenger this year. They didn't lose a whole lot from last year's team. Kyle Bowen's gone, but most of the rest, that that team, that core is back together for the Gales. But they got Gonzaga at number one. They got St. Mary's at number two. Beyond that, they got San Francisco coming in at three, LMU at four, and Santa Clara at five. And I think that's pretty definitively the top five. In the conference right now, I think there are a couple different ways you could potentially order it starting at the top, but I think it's going to be those top five. What's going to be interesting to me is the battle between LMU and San Francisco for that third spot. I think Santa Clara is in that conversation as well. No disrespect to Herb Sendek's squad, but to me, LMU and USF had tremendous off seasons. Both these teams brought in premier talent. LMU, of course, adds Dominic Harris from Gonzaga. They added a couple other mid-major guards who were 15-point-per-game scores at their respective schools. I really like what LMU was able to do, even though it's going to be real hard to replace Cam Shelton in his production. Similar story at USF. They, of course, lose Khalil Shabazz. Zane Meeks transfers over to Arizona State. But they add Mike Share of Jumps, a.k.a. Mongolian Mike from Dayton, six foot eight point guard. He's going to be a real problem for WCC teams. So I think that uh, between USF's additions, not only him, they also add Jonathan Magbo from Missouri State. They add Malik Thomas from uh, from USC. I think that that's a team that is really going to make some noise. Are they going to be a tournament team like they were a few years ago with Jamari Bouye? I'm not sure if they can reach that threshold, but this is a team to legitimately look out for in the WCC. And I think the battle between them and LMU is going to be a really fun one. So you got Zags, Gales, San Francisco, LMU, Santa Clara, top five. They got UP at six, Pepperdine at seven. That's a nice little jump for Lorenzo Romar's team. Pacific at eight and the San Diego Toreros coming in at the bottom at number nine. And that's, that's, a, that's a rough rough one for Steve Lavin and the Toreros. You know, Lav, Coach Lavin took over last year. Nobody expected it to be a one-year turnaround necessarily, but a guy who's coached at, he coached at UCLA, he coached at St. John's, has tremendous basketball pedigree, but he took seven years off between coaching at UCLA and St. John's, and he took seven years off again before returning to San Diego. You got to wonder how much of a leash – they're going to give Coach Lavin. If this team finishes behind Pepperdine and Pacific, I'm curious what that's going to look like. This was one of the worst three-point defending teams in the entire country last year. It felt like there was maybe a 
not quite the adjustment to the modern college basketball game that you might have hoped for or expected from a coach who who's been around the game, who's been commentating the game for the last half decade or so, but you know hadn't been on the sidelines for a long time. Be interested to see if that program can turn it around or if they do end up in the cellar of the WCC this season. Next up, I want to talk some WCC award predictions. They made predictions in the Almanac for Player of the Year, Defensive Player of the Year, Newcomer, and Coach. They also predicted the All-First and All-Second teams, and there was a coaches poll with a handful of fun questions we'll get to here momentarily. WCC award predictions, Player of the Year. They're predicting Aiden Mahaney. And I get it. I totally get it. I would point out that their top 100 had Ryan Nemhart a few spots ahead of Aiden Mahaney, although I think that Mahaney is probably more likely to put up better scoring numbers. It's it's hard to say. I think Mahaney's going to be a bigger part of St. Mary's offense in the sense that he will score a higher percentage of their points. But Gonzaga's going to score a lot more points. I mean, a lot more points. St. Mary's going to score 58 points a game, 63 points a game, something like that. Gonzaga scoring 85. You know, Mahaney might have a similar points per game to Nembhard, but that is a much bigger percentage of his team's overall points. Mahaney is extremely good. I think it's reasonable to have him be the favorite right now heading into that player of the year award, but Ryan Nembhard's got a real chance of winning that one as well. Defensive player of the year, guess what? It's coming down to a Gale and a Zag as well. They are leaning with the St. Mary's player, Mitchell Saxon. To me, Anton Watson, really strong candidate. I know many of you are thinking the same thing as well, but here's the kicker. St. Mary's is going to be a better defensive team than Gonzaga. There's almost no way that won't be the case. If it's not the case, it's either because Gonzaga is somehow stunningly one of the 10 or five best defensive teams in the country, which feels unlikely based on roster construction, or St. Mary's defense collapses and completely falls apart. But realistically, Gonzaga, you know, in a good season, they might be a top 50 defensive team. They were 72nd last year. I think they could make some improvements, but I think they're probably top 50-ish defensive team. St. Mary's might be top five. Very real chance they're top five, if not top 10. So Mitchell Saxon, seven foot center for them, you know, multi-year guy. We've seen him for for a couple of years now. If he blocks two, two shots per game, if he grabs 10, 11 boards per game, if he's kind of the enforcer for the best defensive team in the WCC and arguably one of the best defensive teams in the country, he's going to win defensive player of the year. Anton Watson may be a more versatile defensive player. He may be an overall more skilled defensive player. He has very active hands. He's very physical. He gets a lot of steals. He's not a great rim protector because of his size and length, but he is adequate at it. I think Watson's maybe a more versatile, maybe more overall talented defensive player. But if the season shakes out the way that it looks like it will in terms of how these teams perform overall defensively, it's going to be hard for somebody from St. Mary's not to win this award. And Saxon is the most obvious candidate. Next up, Newcomer of the Year. No debates here. They're giving it to Ryan Nempar. That is correct. Hard to imagine him not taking home that award. Coach of the Year, they go with Stan Johnson. Look, if LMU finishes fourth behind San Francisco, I don't think Stan Johnson wins this award. I think Chris Gerlifson might at San Francisco if they finish third. They kind of like to not give it to Mark Few and Randy Bennett. If Randy Bennett and St. Mary's beats Gonzaga, he probably wins it, and he probably deserves it. Uh, But for me, Stan Johnson only wins it if they finish third or if they legitimately push for second. Not saying he doesn't deserve it. I think Stan Johnson's a great coach, really, really good coach. But I them projecting that that team to finish fourth and giving the award to Johnson, I don't think that those two things would both happen at the same time. All-conference first team for the Almanox projections here. Aiden Mahaney and Mitchell Saxon from St. Mary's. Ryan Nemhard and Graham Ike from Gonzaga. No surprises there. Fifth and final member is Tyler Robertson from the University of Portland. Also not a surprise. Really versatile player. Uh, Score, distributor, passer in his final season of eligibility. He's going to put up big numbers for Shantae Leggins and the Pilots. Second team, you have Anton Watson from Gonzaga. Darn right, he's going to be on the second team or first team. He's not going to be left off like he was last year, that's for sure. You also have Alex Dukas from St. Mary's giving you three three gales and three zags on the first and second team. You also have Mongolian Mike, Mike Sheriff Jumps from San Francisco, Houston Millett from Pepperdine coming back for the waves, and Kile Leo Pepe from LMU rounding it out. 
I think this seems pretty solid. I like Javon Porter a lot from Pepperdine. I think he could make some real noise, younger brother of Michael Porter Jr., who, of course, was a key piece for the Denver Nuggets last year. But I think for the most part, this is probably uh, the, the right 10 players to be projecting at this point for, uh, for the WCC. Finally, I want to close it out here talking about the coaches poll. These were interviews they did with the WCC coaches. They had a breakout candidate in the conference. The coaches picked Chris Tilly for Santa Clara. I like that pick. I have a yo question mark written in my notes because I think he could very realistically be a breakout candidate in the conference as well. Scariest player to game plan against was voted as Aiden Mahaney. Gonzaga knows that very intimately, so I'm not surprised that he is the one getting that award. The best pro pot prospect in the conference, there's where Javon Porter comes in, 6'10", stretch four, high-level athlete who can shoot it from deep. I, I can understand why he is an appealing NBA prospect. Hardest team to prep for, St. Mary's. No arguments there. Gonzaga has historically been on this list, but this year's team I think is hard to prep for because they're a little bit less uh, – known they're a less known commodity but st mary's in the way that they play is they're always a tough out uh, sleeper team is the university of portland and the best development staff goes to gonzaga as it absolutely unquestionably should we're gonna wrap it up there uh talking about the almanac at least again go buy it go 20 bucks eight hundred thousand words completely worth it there'll be a link in the show notes as well but Right now, we're going to close out the show talking about the women's basketball non-conference schedule and how it should go a long way toward building this team a strong net ranking to avoid last year's NCAA tournament seeding nightmare. More coming up on that after a word from today's sponsor, FanDuel. Football season is here, and FanDuel is giving you a chance to win all season long. Because right now, when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets back every single time they win during the regular season. Just pick any team to win the Super Bowl and you'll get bonus bets for every single victory. You can use your bonus bets on spreads, on player props, on the money line, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. All right, folks, closing out the show today, taking a look at Gonzaga's women's basketball non-conference schedule. We spoke with Brenna Maxwell, starting shooting guard for that team uh, on a recent episode of Locked on Zags. If you haven't checked it out and you want to, go check back in your feed. It was last week, three or four episodes ago as you're listening to this. So uh, definitely check it out. Fantastic interview. And she did talk a little bit about the non-conference schedule, about how they're working hard to prevent what happened last year. What happened last year is this team was very good. They lost very few games, but because the WCC didn't, perform particularly well as a conference. BYU did not have a good season that hurt significantly. Gonzaga got a nine seed despite having three losses. And that really hurt them in the NCAA tournament. Lisa Fortier said, hey, we are not dealing with that again. We know BYU is out of the conference, so we don't have that safety net of a, a top, uh, you know, a quad one or at least a quad two game on the schedule. So we're going to go out and get as many tough ones as we possibly can. Here's a look at that schedule. I'm just going to read through it right here. They got an exhibition opener at home against Warner Pacific on November 2nd. Four days later, they will be on the road at Montana against the Grizzlies, stay on the road to play Washington State on, on November 9th. Uh, Washington State was a five seed in the NCAA tournament last year. They did lose in the first round to a 12 seed Florida Gulf Coast team, but still always good to get a Pac-12 game on the schedule. And of course, a team that was a top five seed in the big dance. The regular season home opener will be against Toledo on the 12th of November. Toledo was a 12 seed last year and they upset five seeded Iowa State. So a quality opponent there. And they got Wyoming at home on the 18th. Then they'll go to Katy, Texas in the Van Chancellor Classic. That's going to take place over the Thanksgiving break, the 24th through the 26th. They got three games there. They'll play Liberty. They'll play Louisville. Louisville was a five seed last year who went all the way to the Elite Eight. Gonzaga did play them last year uh, in their MTE. And they're also going to play Alabama in this tournament. Alabama was a 10 seed last year who lost in the first round to a seven seeded Baylor squad. Love getting to pick up two power five opponents in Louisville and Alabama. After that, they play on the road at Eastern Washington. They got Washington State and Eastern Washington and Montana all on the road. Gonzaga, the men's team would never do this. And I kind of love that the women's team is going out and playing those road games. Very, very fun to see. Then they get to host Stanford 
a game that's been happening for over a decade between Gonzaga and Stanford. Fantastic to see this non-conference rivalry continue. Uh, that game will be on December 3rd. Stanford was a one seed last year. They got upset in the second round by an eight-seeded Ole Miss team, the same team that beat Gonzaga in that first round as well. Then they go on the road to play Cal on the 7th of December and Rice on the 9th. So they'll head down to Berkeley and then head all the way out to Houston to play the Rice Owls on the 9th. Return home to play South Dakota State. South Dakota State, this game's on the 17th of December. They were a nine seed last year. They beat eight seeded USC in the first round before losing to Virginia Tech as the one seed. This is a specific opponent that Brenna mentioned on that recent episode of Locked On Zag. She said, nobody ever wants to play South Dakota State. And they're a tough team, a physical team, a challenging team, and I think a really quality opponent for Gonzaga to get on the calendar. After that, they'll play in the Jerry Colangelo Classic in Phoenix, Arizona against the Wildcats. Uh, Arizona was a seven seed last year. They beat West Virginia in the first round before losing to two seeded Maryland, another quality Pac-12 opponent for the Zags. Then they close out the non-conference slate at home against New Mexico. Gotta love this. Like we said before, four Pac-12 opponents in what is remaining of the Pac-12. In the final year against the Pac-12, they got four of them on the schedule. Pac-12 women's basketball is fantastic, and we could spend a whole lot more time talking about the sad destruction of the Pac-12 from a women's basketball perspective, but good for Gonzaga to get four of these teams on the opponent. They got seven NCAA tournament teams from last year. Seven of their non-conference opponents played in the big dance last season. They also got tough road games at Cal and Rice. Not qual- not NCAA tournament teams last year, but quality opponents. And it always helps to boost that resume by playing those teams in true road environments. Of course, they also have that MTE where they'll play the Cardinal, excuse me, the Cardinals and Alabama Crimson Tide for that game as well. So a, a quality non-conference schedule, is it enough to counterbalance losing two to three games against BYU? Time will tell. It also will depend on how those WCC teams do. Portland was pretty good last year, but they lost five or six players to the transfer portal. Did they replace them with enough talent to still be a quality opponent? What about the other teams in the conference? Is anybody going to step up? It feels like the WCC is just a little bit behind uh, the men's side in terms of having some of those mid-level teams kind of step up. You know, St. Mary's hasn't become St. Mary's on the women's side. And so we'll have to see if this schedule gives Coach Fortier and the women's basketball team enough leeway to kind of counterbalance potentially playing in a fairly weak WCC next season. Because I'll tell you what, if this team gets through this schedule with these opponents and they only have two to three or four losses, they sure as heck better not be a nine seed. That would be a disgrace because of how talented this team is, how much continuity they have on the roster. I sincerely hope we get to see this team get a fair shake in the NCAA tournament because I think they could make some real noise when March rolls around. All right, that is going to do it for me today here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Thank you so much for making the time out of your day to listen to the show. Shout out to those everyday listeners. And of course, shout out to those of you checking out the show on YouTube. If we're not at 2,000, definitely hit that subscribe button. If we are at 2,000, still go ahead and hit that, that subscribe button. It is very, very much appreciated. We'll be back on Friday with another episode closing out the week, having a fun guest lined up for that show. I'm really excited about it. It should be a great one. Getting closer and closer to October when we'll start that individual player preview series. And then of course, before we know it, college basketball will be back. Very, very excited for that. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as always, go Zags.